right. Thank you, Skyler. And hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us. I'm Jim Hunsinger of Lean Frontiers. And uh, what I want to do today is just really kind of mostly I'm going to kind of tell you a story. Let's see and get it to forward. Try left clicking or right clicking and next and then it shouldn't do that anymore. Okay. There you go. All right, hopefully I'll do it with my cursor. All right. Um, anyway, so here's a basic agenda. I want to, like I said, going to kind of mostly tell a story and then I'll kind of tell kind of the results of the story and some other information. But I want to give a little background um, on how the story came about and then kind of the story itself. And it's kind of an implementation story. Um, then um, what, uh, from an accounting standpoint, from a value stream costing standpoint, we'll talk about that a little bit and how that came about. And then, like I said, the results of it, of um, what we did on the changes and then some other, I guess, uh, pr uh, parameters and uh, even other potential results around this. So with that, I will get started. So to give you a little background, um, I was uh, I was an engineer um, at a company that manufactured small engines and we were going through a lean implementation. So my part of the story kind of started in what we called Department 168, which was a crankshaft machining department um, we call it a um, small engine crankshaft and machining department. And in that department, um, they machined from castings to finish ready to be assembled into the engines, crankshafts, small single throw, um, single cylinder engines. And in this department, there was multiple models that were manufactured crankshafts in this case. In that department, um, I think there was what, five maybe different engine model the crankshafts that were machined. I was taking a look at just one model, our five horsepower engine crankshaft, which is going to go into, I guess, a, what we call, a, I guess, a, a lean transformation. A little bit about this department. It had, oh gosh, it probably had 100 pieces of equipment. Like I said, four or five different models. The model I was work on, working on, the five horsepower, um, had over a million um, crankshafts in this case, annual volume, and it was the lower volume crankshaft out of that department. So there were, I don't know, 10 or 20 million crankshafts that were machined in this department in a year. Um, of the model I was doing, again, the five horsepower, there was over 30 um, part numbers or versions. And generally what that meant was the PTO or power takeoff, um, you can see in the little cartoons, there were variations on that. Um, there's a few other uh, differentiations on some of the bearing surfaces on the crankshaft, but it's mainly on the, on the power takeoff, the PTO, different keyways, different lengths, different diameters, some different configurations. Um, so I was to take the machining of this crankshaft and put it into a manufacturing cell. So we had all kinds of projects going on. This was just one of many projects I had, but a, uh, I guess a um, edict came down from corporate that since we were making these changes to, in this case, the, the plant, we needed to do an ROI, a return on investment of these changes we were making. So what that got me involved in was our costing, our accounting system um, at, uh, at the company. And uh, I, I wasn't real thrilled about this because I had already had more than enough to do, actually. Um, so this is just one more thing in an area I didn't overarchingly have an interest in. Um, but the way we, way we did this is we had these things called cost per hundred sheets, which calculated the cost of the different um, part numbers, in this case, crankshafts, um, each one, so we could get the cost. They would use that um, in uh, decision making. It would you know, roll up into uh, our engines, roll up into the divisions and departments and so forth. So one, I had never been involved in this. So I, had to learn, I had to learn what the heck these cost 100% cost per hundred sheets meant, how to go through and calculate stuff off of them. Um, so I did that, got some help from the de department, this department 168, the foreman, you know, we might call him the supervisor now, we called him foreman in there, a very, very great, good guy, Jim Anderson, very helpful. Um, and he showed me how to calculate, how to calculate cost information for these. I verified that with the divisional accountant so I could go in and start doing the calculations on what these different part numbers cost us to do my ROI calculation. Well, what I found out in going through this, all 30 some of the part numbers, and this took me a while to go through um, to verify information and so forth. This was over a number of weeks period. But as I went through this, 
I found out that uh, one particular part number of crankshafts, which um, was actually nearly 70% of the overall volume, so around almost 700,000 of these we manufactured in this department, um, showed that it cost us 10 to 20% more than this other particular part number, a crankshaft which had a pinion gear on it, which was less than 3% of the overall volume, um, according to our costing system. Um, well, to say this greatly disturbed me was an understatement because on a pinion crankshaft, which was very low volume, particularly relative to this other crankshaft, it had five extra processes on it, um, a grooving process, some extra turning, extra grinding, grinding, um, uh, hardening process, and the gear shaping process, and particularly the hardening and gear shaping processes were very expensive, slow processes. But it showed that it was cheaper for us to manufacture this particular crankshaft than this high volume with just a simple straight uh, shaft and a keyway. I knew that was wrong. I knew that was um, most definitely wrong, let alone the fact it was showing this thing was 10 to 20% more costly for us to manufacture. And the reason it bothered me as a corporation, as a Fortune 500 corporation, we made all our business decisions based off this cost information. So I went to, um, I went to Jeff, the divisional accountant, uh, you know, who kind of came to us and said, hey, corporate wants us to do these, uh, this calculation. I said, Jeff, you know, this information is wrong. And uh, Jeff said, yeah, I know, Jim, but corporate wants, corporate wants us to do this, so we need to calculate these. I said, but, but it's wrong. The information is wrong and very wrong. And Jeff was a very mild-mannered guy. He said, yeah, I know, Jim, but we, we need to do this. Anyway, this, you know, but Jeff, this is wrong, became an ongoing dialogue over a number of weeks um, but I kept going back into him, you know, as I would calculate stuff and just go back and say, but Jeff, this information's wrong. Why are we doing this? This, this in, information is in, inaccurate. Well, over the course of, uh, well, actually several months, um, Jeff and I had uh, actually ended up just getting into kind of an ongoing discussion and conversation around this. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute, but I just want to set up, this is, this is what got me going on um, this, uh, I guess this calculation and when why it bothered me so much on this particular project. So the overall picture we were doing, we were cha literally changing uh, about half the factory. And this factory was, I don't know, I think it was close to maybe 1.5 million square feet. So it was a very large factory. And we were changing half of that because it housed, it housed um, one division, um, what they call large engine division at that time. And then there was another partially housed division um, small engine division, but large engine division was changing their entire manufacturing to go what we call today, you know, to a lean um, um, style plant. So one thing I want to bring up before I'll go into a little more detail about that is uh, this, this goes, this is long enough ago, there were no, there were really not very many books on the subject of lean, let alone lean accounting or value stream costing anything. We were actually, at the time where I was doing this, probably um, close to uh, uh, a decade from even the term um, value stream, let alone value stream costing. So there's a few books published by um, Productivity Press, the Shingo books are out, the, I don't know if you remember the little orange Kanban book, that was about our only points of reference. Um, my background, I had worked for a Toyota group company um, prior to coming to this organization, that's one of the reasons they hired me. I was supposed to know something about the Toyota production system, but uh, there just really there were really no resources. The internet didn't really exist, certainly as we know it today. There weren't really many seminars or or anything like that, let alone podcasts and all the stuff we have today. It just didn't exist. So literally, the uh, uh, us doing this project, managers and engineers, we were left to our own accord to make this happen. So I bring that up because we did have one very significant design parameter um, with this. And, and we did refer to it, you know, not overly frequently, but sometimes as our North Star. Um, this is before there's such thing as a future state or target condition for Kata or value stream mapping people um, and so forth. But again, that's, those things were years from coming out. Um, but our single design parameter, or as we call it periodically, our, our North Star was simply one piece flow. We were going to design this new, uh, this changing plant or actually division into true one piece flow. So that impacted us on the way we thought about line layout, plant layout, manning, fixture design, machine tool design, 
uh, material flow, everything, this single design parameter um, was what, what drove us um, with that. So with that, we were, we were taking these traditional departments, this is back to crankshaft, um, take these traditional departments and they were, like I said, very, very traditional. So um, the, on the slide, there's kind of a little tiny cartoon version of it. You know, we'd have our lays all in one, you know, lined up together, our drills, and there'd be different kinds of lays, grinders, and so on. It was all laid out by process, or really types of machines more than even process to some degree. And like I said, through this one department, crankshaft department, we had, I don't know, what, 8, 10, 11, 12 million crankshafts that we would produce each year of these different models. So we had tens of thousands of working parts of work in process of varying degrees um, throughout the process of machining for the crankshafts. Um, so I started to take the five horsepower and put it into a true one piece flow cell, um, again, by, by the um, cartoon. Um, and this was going on all over this division, you know, uh, pistons and cylinders and cam gears and so forth. It was actually seeming at times it was very chaotic, but actually overall it was actually fairly decently orchestrated um, considering we were completely rearranging um, five different engine models. So the five horsepower was just one and this was just one component, crankshafts. And of the large engines that we were doing this to, the five horsepower was the highest volume, a little over a million per year. Um, and then the different engine models varied down to a little under 500,000 and then in between. So overall, you're talking about a huge amount of work in process. Um, like I said, tens of thousands um, every day. Um, in this one department, like I said, uh, Jim Anderson, the guy that was a foreman of it, he, he had told me that uh, over a year they would lose um, oh, anywhere from a few thousand to maybe tens of thousands of crankshafts out of the department. Now, that didn't mean people were, the, the operators were sticking them in their pockets and walking out with them. It's just, if you could imagine trying to manage the logistics of tens of thousands of parts when you're making millions of these in just this one department a year, just trying to manage the logistics of it. And it was just simply impossible. So depending on the year, depending on the mix, depending on things, they would just kind of lose um, track of that many. So you just even from that standpoint, they didn't have a good grasp on it. No fault of their own, um, but it was just difficult. But from an engineer standpoint, we were kind of having a field day. Like I said, we had all these projects going on. We were physically changing literally this entire plan on a massive scale. Actually, to this day, um, I've not seen a change of this scale that happened in the time we did it over the course of a couple of years, and also by running full production through the whole time. So as we tore apart these departments and set up these new one piece flow cells, we had to maintain full production through the whole thing. So a lot of times, even after we'd set up a cell, it might go in a temporary location because we might have to turn around and move it again, just the logistics of moving um, a massive amount of these, these uh, uh, we call them focus factories. Um, into, into what, become, what would eventually become the permanent location. We had a final layout for all that, but just the, the chest moving that we had to do in order to orchestrate that was pretty significant. So like I said, kind of chaotic, but actually was managed overall very well. Um, so here's an example. So what we were doing, we're putting things in, like I said, we called them focus factories. Today, we call them value streams. That term didn't exist. We also were taking the term focus factory way back when in the late 80s, I think it was, there's some books by Arthur Anderson that referred to them as focus factories. To be quite honest, I still like that um, name because these we were really making factories within a factory. Um, this is actually an actual CAD drawing of the crankshaft machining in the new layout and then kind of a kind of a little rendering of how we were setting these things up, all the major components flowing with marketplaces. Because prior to that, we'd even keep tens of thousands of finished components in stock. So we were trying to mitigate down the, the amount of inventory, not only within the process of the departments, because the departments became a cell, but also in the marketplaces we'd have and feed in the assembly line. So this is kind of running of the different focus factors look like there'd be five of these um, with that. The other thing with doing this is in, which is why we had to coordinate this, moving it all into areas where all these departments pre-existed and moving in these new focus factories um, and getting it lined up eventually in the, in the layouts that we wanted. The other thing we were doing is uh, we were implementing new 
um, processes, not only the layout, but also new processes. So it ranged from brand new at times where we could justify it, CNC equipment um, to equipment. When I got one of the manuals for one of the grinders we had in the crankshaft department, the date on the grinder and when the, our company purchased it was prior to the United States getting bombed at Pearl Harbor. So we had some equipment from the 1930s all the way up to the present. This would present this would have been in the 90s and every and kind of every year in between. So we were trying to utilize this this older equipment into um, these flow cells as we were putting things together. Again, back into that, and that was all these major components that we were doing on five different um, engine models, and all in the, all of them in the originally in these traditional departments with, uh, um, like I said, tens of thousands of parts of work in process um, into doing this. So in the course of, of doing this, you know, you hear about people making these improvements of work in process. Well, we didn't, we weren't trying to make improvements of work in process. It really was just simply a default of the physicality of the changes we were making. So for example, um, there would have been tens of thousands, depending on the year and our, you know, where we're at in the seasonality, of just this model, uh, this uh, model 13 is what we call it, a five horsepower engine um, into the new cell. So there've been tens of thousands down to, I think, I don't know, we had 25 or 30 parts of work in process, maybe 35. So now you see how we get this 99.9% .9 reduction in work in process. It was just default of the physical changes we were doing by the um, um, changing into one piece flow. We were documenting it, of course, but we were going, we need to do this so we get less inventory. We just knew it'd be, it would happen as a result of this. So um, uh, like I said, pretty, pretty significant, significant. Another factor we had was actually our company actually had, a, had bad relationships with the union um, there and we were making all these changes. And I will have to say this, working with the shop people, I never had any issues. The company and the union had issues, but working with the operators, the setup folks and all that, we never had issues. Um, I, I literally broke, I guess, what you might call union rules on a daily basis, but we were really trying to work hand in hand together to, to try to solve problems and, and get this implemented. And the shop people were, even though they didn't always understand everything, they were very understanding and cooperating with what we we're doing and all the in a sense, all the crazy experiments we were running to do this. We also had, um, I had gone with a small group from our, of our organization to some of the original say, Kaizen workshops, originally done by Productivity um, Inc. Um, and they were called Five Days in One Night. And we brought that back to here as we we're going through this process. We actually brought, for those of you who might know, the Shinji Jitsu in to do a couple of the workshops with us. Um, that's who that's who when I went to the first one, it was at a Danaher Corporation um, with the original original principles of uh, sh the Shinji Jitsu, Mr. Iwata, Mr. Nakal, and Mr. Takanaka. But after we did a couple of those, we took over, and in a sense, my department, um, engineering department, took over doing these uh, workshops um, as, for the corporation as a whole. And we actually called them make it the make it happen workshops. So anyway, we are going through this process. So kind of, uh, my next slide is, so yeah, so back to my story about talking with accountant. All through this, a lot of this process, I was having these discussions with Jeff, the divisional accountant, um, because this didn't make sense. So we were having dialogues and he would ask me, you know, the what the way, way, way I thought the, I guess the costing should be done. I was like, well, I don't know. I'm an engineer. I'm not an accountant. I'm not real sure, but here's what I'm thinking. Well, eventually after months of these discussions, I was in his office one day and we were talking about it. And uh, he said, well, hey, Jim, I have something to show you. Okay, what's that? Well, he brought up an Excel spreadsheet on his computer and he kind of looked, he said, um, uh, is this what you've been kind of talking about, what you've had in your mind? And I kind of looked at it and asked him some questions around it. And finally, went, yeah, I, yeah, I think that looks like it makes sense. I think that's generally what I had in my head. Um, and we talked about it some more and I just got a better grasp of what he was doing. But the thing with the good thing about Jeff is even prior to me coming in and talking to him about this, I guess this, uh, this mouthy engineer, he'd already had in mind that the way they traditionally track costs, because it's based on all this logistical tracking and tickets and, and man hours on the, uh, tied into the process in particular specific machines and all that. 
he knew just that was going to change because the physicality of what we were doing in the plant was uh, changing pretty drastically. He just wasn't sure what, but he used the discussions with me to help himself kind of go through this process of developing what we would call value stream costing today. So what Jeff had on his screen was value stream costing um, on the different components in this case, um, the crankshaft cylinders, cam gears, so on and so forth of the components of each of the engine models and it'd roll up into the engine assembly and roll up into the, what we call the focus factory. So add all that. So the interesting thing about it was, uh, like I said, this would be value stream costing, but our formal name for it was Jeff's spreadsheet. So we did end up doing the ROI. We did send that off to corporate. Um, but the other interesting thing is, as we brought the, this new division, the layout up, on, up online, is he did some calculations for corporate to give to him in the manner they wanted. But all the, all the, all the costing we did for the division, we used Jeff's spreadsheet. We talked about something, we go, I don't know, let's see what Jeff's spreadsheet says. Um, so we went through that process. So I got to give, you know, hats off to Jeff these years ago that he was able to somewhat think through this on his own accord without all these resources, just really trying to reflect which accounting in this sense should be anyway, reflect what was happening on the shop floor. How were, how were resources being consumed in order to make the components and products we were making? So with that, I want to go through... Um, I guess some, I guess the results, I think that's what's next. Yeah. So let me walk through some of the results that we've got, we got out of this. Again, like I said, this is long enough ago. Um, actually, the book, even Lean Thinking, wasn't out yet when we were going through this process. The machine that changed the world was out a few years. Um, you know, like I said, some of the Shingo books, Productivity Press had, had translated and so forth. But originally, before we went through this process, the, the percent of, uh, of the cost of each of these component parts, in this case, crankshaft, pistons or whatever, 80% of that was an overhead glob, I like to call it. Essentially, we really had no idea what, what that overhead, overhead glob really was broken down into. We knew there was corporate, we knew there was divisional, we knew there was department, but really the dollars and cents that made that 80% of what each one of these crankshafts cost, we had no idea. Post us making these changes, we knew 85% of what these costs were directly. They were known. We knew exactly what they were. And in this case below, what the, it really most everything became direct costs. Material, um, labor, uh, equipment, floor space, tooling, utilities, literally almost everything. Um, so for example, uh, on labor, before they would try to track it through tickets and processes and, you know, would have to go into the department to get calculated, a department that calculated from all these tickets, assuming fi people fill them out right, uh, uh, assuming, assuming they fill them out at all, um, and how to allocate everything. Um, and it was just a mess. Like I said, by no fault of the people, they meant well, it was just so complex and convoluted, it was impossible to do. But now we knew what, exactly what it was, 85% were the, the um, resources being consumed by each of these components. And of the leftover 15%, which were overhead costs, we, could, we had a good breakdown of those. We knew how much was corporate. We knew how much was divisional. We knew how much was even the focus factory. The focus factory with the focus factory plant manager. There was usually a couple of engineers assigned to it, um, you know, uh, supervisors or, um, that we had and so forth. So we knew what that was as well. We knew corporate was more of a glob, but it was only a portion of that 15%. And the divisional became just, we had better confidence in the divisional breakdown and certainly the focus factory breakdown, we knew very directly. So really of the 100% of that cost, probably 90, 87, 88, 90%, we knew exactly what the, where the costs were coming from. The other thing we were able to do with Jeff's spreadsheet is we could change it because those were allocated. We could change the allocations literally on a daily or even hourly basis if we wanted to, because it made it that simple. Where in traditional things, you had to go through a whole time study process and, and have to go through that department, get calculated and negotiated. And it was just a long, cumbersome process. So we didn't change it very much, which is one of the reasons things weren't accurate. But this way we could literally change it. But we didn't have to because things were so stabilized and accurate. Um, changes just weren't re really necessary. And when we didn't need to do them, we would change them. So the, the main result of this was this 
financial information that we had now was accurate. And we could make business decisions, you know, buy or sell or um, invest in the equipment and so forth. We could make decisions and we knew the information we were using was good information. And that was terribly important. Like I said, that was, that was my crux of the original crux of this thing is I knew we were using this information for decision making. It was inaccurate. So I knew we were not making good decisions. So that's kind of a result of that. And some more things that came out of this as well, too. Um, so uh, if you think about it, and we were doing Kaizen workshops through this process, but we were also implementing, it was kind of a hybrid of taking old processes and changing them, with, you know, Kaizen, implementing new processes, machines, and, and so forth. But traditionally, um, if, you, if you look at the Kaizen process, 80% uh, of your costs are in a sense committed to the product and process because you do that really in the development stage. So you're somewhat stuck with whatever your costs are, 80% um, of it. You could really, and again, it's going to vary industry to industry and so forth. But really, when you do the Kaizen activity, not that you shouldn't do it, not that it's not important, not that you can't make a, a cost impact, you can, but you really only get an impact around 20% of the costs. So going through this uh, flow implementation that we we're doing, it would by default reduce your capital requirements and basically open up um, you know, the capital you wouldn't spend now um, in for investment into other areas. And a couple of reasons to do that. One would be, so um, when we're going through this process, particularly because we did this with a new um, engine model, uh, when we were starting out the, the uh, project, we would go to marketing, actually our, our um, product engineers, because they were tied closely with marketing and marketing and ask them, two or sometimes three times a week, what volumes are you projecting? What volumes are you projecting? Just constantly, because the volume they pr would project would change the way we'd be spending capital because we were, in a way, right-sizing it to the volume demand needed. So the advantage of that was we, if, uh, we would spend less capital up front, and they had projections over years that the volume would go up. But the other advantage was if for whatever reason the volume didn't go up, we didn't have capital already committed to that higher volume. We would increment up capital investment as true production demand um, warranted. So there is also a, a potential capital savings or spending capital at a, in a more timely manner versus spending it to make sure we can hit these higher volumes. And if volumes don't go up, well, you're out of luck because you've already spent the capital. Um, also too, it helped us to reduce our lead time um, from a new pro product um, 40 to 60 percent to the launch. Now we got better with it because as we went through this process, and this kind of relates to the some of the, bu the bullets below, it would lower it would lower our developmental costs, and also we developed more knowledge for future developments. So when we were doing this this original exercise, um, we were just running experiments all over the place. And uh, as far as the engineers, we were sharing stuff. We would reference each other. You know, Mike who was working on uh, some crankshaft and rod uh, machining, he would go, hey, Jim, come, I have this experiment I'm going to run. Come, come check out what I'm going to do. Let me explain it to you so I could critique him and vice versa. So we were sharing what we were doing. We we're critiquing what each other were doing. And the, the knowledge gain we got was tremendous. So as we went into, you know, other projects or um, other, uh, like the new in, uh, engine we were working on, we were bringing all that knowledge all that experimentation, and some of the experiments went great, some of them were complete disasters, but boy, did we learn from them. Um, we were bringing all that forward. So that was some that helped on the lead time reduction to launch because we had such greater knowledge and experience and we were sharing it, we could, we could run better experiments and run them faster and could critique them better. So that helped improve the lead time. Plus it just helped to get us better results on when we, would, when we decide on a particular process that we were going to invest in. So those three things run together, that lead time reduction, the cost of development reduction, and just we could do it, I like to say, at a faster velocity and, and better magnitude because of the experience and knowledge that we had gained through it. Um, the other thing I found with this was actually, in most cases, new technology is not needed. To write design processes, um, you, really, you didn't need new technology. Um, this could be a whole other subject matter, but we built some machines internally. Some were kind of, you know, machines out of a catalog, you know, a lathe. 
and some we'd go to outside machine tool builders to build it to build it. But what we do is we didn't need new technology. We would just build it and build them under different constraints. We'd go to the machine tool builders and say, we'd like to build a machine, but instead of this big machine like you traditionally build, we need it scaled down. So that would help to reduce costs. That would help with flow design um, as far as doing a one piece flow design cells. But we, I did not find any time that we needed significant new technology. We just need to think about it differently. And ultimately what this did was um, it, it, it increased the results we got from production and uh, basically improved our R&D in a sense. We think of R&D traditionally in new products. Obviously that is part of R&D, but part of R&D is also new uh, production techniques. So we were doing this and this references to uh, Say's law, probably not too many of you heard of it from 1903. The Say's law is, production precedes demand. So the R&D, the better improvements you're going into, into product development. And in this case, and this is something else we learned, product development and process development had to go hand in hand. And when you did that, it improved both of those. So again, back to our, our lead time would go down, our result would be better, um, our costs would go down on top of it. So we'd have, not only we'd have better investment, but we wouldn't spend as much. So we'd have stuff left over from traditional things that we, we could invest elsewhere. Um, so I think with that, I think that is the end. Um, so certainly if you have any questions, Skyler, let me know if any questions came up or you can reach me. My email is on this last slide, jim at leanfrontiers.com. And also too on this slide, I reference, uh, there's three articles um, I reference that give more information on this subject as well. Two of them are on our um, website. Uh, you can find them. The, the third one isn't, although I will get it up there posted. I didn't realize it wasn't up there. So thank you all very much. And Skylar, if there's any questions, let me know and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Jim. Um, currently, we don't have any questions that have come in. If anybody does have a question, you can send it in through chat or like Jim said, you can contact him directly through his email. Also, just a reminder, you will receive a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. And I don't have any questions in, so I am going to go ahead and close out the webinar. Jim, thank you again for attending today. And thank, thank you, you to everybody who joined us. Have a great day. Bye-bye.